Hello friends of the electrified charging fun and welcome to Speicher Elektrisiert, your channel all about Škoda's e-mobility. My name is Matthias and it's time for a road trip. And don't worry, I will not talk about some hiking tours in the Swiss Alps because you already told me you're not interested in that because this is a channel around cars and not hiking. But we are talking about the suitability of the Enyaq in everyday use if you go on a short trip on vacation for one week two adults and one dog. Yes, you heard it right. We now have a dog since March and you will get him to know it's Marley. He's coming right from his morning hike. And we look at the consumption when we drive into the Engadin, which is part of Graubünden or the canton of Grison. And to go there for some autumn hikes, we talk about range anxiety or the so-called German Reichweitenangst, about charging stress and everything that comes together if you want to go on vacation with an EV. And of course, we look how you can pack up your Skoda if you've got a dock and all your luggage for going on a hike. Let's go. If you're going on vacation, you normally take too much stuff with you. And so do we. As you can see, this is what we take with us for a week. There is our casual wear, our hiking wear, this IKEA back here, this is just for the dock. And of course, all my filming equipment here for doing the video, some backpacks for going on the hike, hiking boots and some accessory. And normally you would say there's no problem getting this into this car because you have nearly 600 liters of trunk volume. But maybe you can see it already. If you are on the way with a dog, then things start to change. And now we have a dog box. And this dog box takes up about 80% of our trunk. Yeah, you could go with a smaller one, but we, should, we want to find the balance between comfort and safety for our dog and us. And so he is in the trunk with this big box. And yeah, there is not much capacity left. Also, you cannot reach down to the hatch here below of the transport package because this box is mounted. And yeah, where to put all the luggage when the dock is in the back. You might say, why don't you put the dock on the rear seat? Yes, would be an option to put him here on the rear seat, but when it comes to safety, I guess the dog box is it's a much better option and it's all about the hair. If the dog is on the rear seat, you've got the hair everywhere in the car. And if you've got that dog box, the hair stays quite well in the trunk. So we will put our luggage here on the rear seat and I will now load the car, put everything in. And then you can see how easy it is to travel with such a large dog box and all the luggage. There's one point I would like to address right now, and that is if the Enyaq would have a frunk, it would be much easier to, stow, uh, to store some stuff. But unfortunately, the Enyaq does not have a trunk, so, uh, does not have a frunk, so there is no option to put anything in the front. Yeah, I know there is a third party solution with a very small frunk, but it has no cover and nothing, and I'm not quite convinced that this is a good solution, so I don't have it. Now everything is packed up in the car. As you can see, Mali has entered his dog box, curiously awaiting where we will head now. And the IKEA bag just fits perfectly at the left side of the box, as well as our hiking boots and some camera equipment. I packed something in there and the trunk still has space left. The rest is up here on the rear seat. As you can see, our bags are on top of the seats and our backpacks are just behind the seats. I try to pack everything that even if in the case of an accident nothing flies around. It's always a trade-off. If you pack stuff into the back of your car, it is always the possibility that in case of a crash or an accident it flies around. But with a dog you don't have so many options and I guess this is quite a good solution. So. Now I show you the route and all the calculations of the car and you hear Mali is barking already, he wants to go. So no more time to spend on packaging of the car, let's head out. As you can see, I've charged my Enyaq up to 100%. Yes, right now we are already 1% down. This is due to recording the video and doing the route planning, which was a bit complicated, but more on that in a minute. And the range I have 
364 kilometers is so low because of my everyday way to work where the consumption is a bit higher so the estimation gets down. Normally it would be 420 to 430 kilometers. Let's look at our route today and here you can see it. We are going to Pontresina in Engadin which is in the canton of Grison and the Enyaq would go via Coeur and all the way down here. This is a faster route but we don't want it. We want to go over the Flula Pass because it's just a scenic route. And the only way to get the Enyaq planning this route was adding the Vos as an intermediate goal and we don't stop there. We drive directly to the second intermediate goal which is Bever where we do our first hike of the vacation. Let's have a look at the data. Here you can see it. The Enyaq thinks we need about two hours to Pontresina and we will be there with 64% SOC. But that does not matter because we go to Bever and one hour, 50 minutes and 66% SOC. This is what the Enyaq thinks. One thing that bugged me all the time is the display of the map when you're driving uphill or downhill. You see these artifacts down here? Why isn't it possible to show a correct map? Why is it broken? This bothers me since I have my ENIAC that they do not fix this graphical issue. It's annoying. Of course, it's not really critical. You can see the path, you can drive, you have all the navigation information, but it's a really annoying bug and I really hope Skoda might fix this. Arrived at the intermediate destination in Bever where we go on our first hike and as you can see I'm down to 62%. That's 4% less than Skoda calculated. Not bad if you think that he did not calculate any incline, any height. We are here at the Ray Power. It's a visitor's place. This seems to be the parking lot of the factory right here but the public charger is right here. As you can see it's a public charger. There it is. We've got a free spot. So I will plug in now. With 62% this is not the optimal thing to do. It's a bit too much SOC. So I set to charge up to 90% right here and uh, while we are on a hike and let's see what will happen. Some e-mobility basics if you're at a charger where you should bring your own cable. I have the one which Skoda provides me and it's quite easy. First you always plug in into the charger with this small end. Sometimes you can access them directly. Sometimes you need to authorize yourself before. So plug it in and then you plug in the car. Right now I'm not standing optimal here. Normally I would back up with the rear but it's easier for Mali who's over there to get out if I park this way. Then you plug in here and next thing is you need to authorize at the station. Since I already filmed the German version of starting the charging I cannot show you directly how it works but I can simulate it. As soon as you're at the charger you take an app like this one here from ENBW. You select the charging station and next thing would be to select charging point. I show you here. Now both are used because I'm plugged in. And then you just need to look for this number right here. It's in the app. You find the number on the charger right here. As you can see, this is the number. The number is also here in the app. Select it and just start charging. As it does here, you can see it. Point one is now charging my car. Now when you're back from the hike or whatever activity, draw you to an AC slow charger and the charging isn't done yet, there's an easy way to stop it. As you can see, I'm still charging, having charged nearly 22 kilowatt hours and now it's quite easy. You can stop it in the app or in the car, sometimes also at the station with the card from your charging provider or if everything else fails, you can even stop charging with your car key tapping the opening button twice. But we use the app right here, hit stop and after a couple of seconds charging has stopped. As you can see, we already got a white light and can now remove the plug from the car. And if this happens, you need the car key because it's still locked here and it's quite easy to solve. I need to go around to my backpack, grab my car's key. Let me search for them. There they are. And 
great showcase. Just see here, I tap on the opening button twice and now I can remove the plug. As you can see, I'm up to 88% SOC, so there are still 2% missing. So I didn't block the spot here for the charging session because I could still load a bit more. But is this really so? Because if you look like here, I hit AC current reducement that was activated so that the ENIAC only charges with 5.5 kilowatts instead of 11 kilowatts. Is this fair? Well, one would say no, because you block the spot longer than needed. But on the other hand, an AC spot, a slow charger, this is something where you want to stop, where you need time because you go on sightseeing, go on shopping or like we did, go on a hike and you need plenty of time. So it's a bit of a trade-off. And write me in the comments if you find this fair, if you reduce the current to be able to stay longer at a charging point without getting block uh, fees. On the other side, at a DC charging station, you cannot do this because you simply do not have an option in the software menu and you shouldn't stay there longer as needed. That's at least my opinion. While we are still standing at the charging station here, let's talk about charging tariffs and all the charging providers and the complete chaos that goes with this. Write me in the comments what you think about this. But when I look at this, this is a charging station from a local provider named, Charge, uh, named Plug and Roll. And if you would use their app, it would be really cheap. But I don't have their app. I used a German app from ENBV and from EMBW and it's not the cheapest one. It's on par with the PowerPass app. I don't have any subscriptions in those apps, but it's a real mess. If you want the cheapest provider, you need a dozen of apps. So let's, let, let's look at from another point. If this charger would be blocked, there is the next station, the train station with a charger right behind us, but the provider is different. It isn't plug and roll, it's Verta and there, everything changes. Other apps are cheaper than here. And if this would be blocked, we could go even one train station further. There's another charger, but from Move Mobility. And again, everything is new there. Everything is different there with all the tariffs. And this is terrible. So what I do, I do not try to optimize on coast anymore. I have simply two apps right now. It's PowerPass and EMBW. And I choose the one which starts the charging. So I have a calculable uh, amount of money I spend on charging and it's always the same on every charger. How do you deal with this? Write me in the comments. Are you one who likes to use a dozen apps to be always on the cheap side or do you have your provider which you use no matter the costs? And for me, this is a big problem for people who get started in e-mobility. They don't know which provider they should take. And it doesn't stop there. The next thing is, should I, do, should I have a subscription or not with those providers? And it's so hard to answer because then it also differs from country to country. It's, for me, still a total mess. Write me in the comments what you think and maybe what you have for a solution. Well, normally I would take this shot in my car when talking about range anxiety or German Reichweitenangst. But I thought, why should I sit in the car when I am out in nature hiking? So I can do the talk right here when we make a break from our hike. The dog, the wife already resting down there at the river. And I took my smartphone out because I don't have my camera with me. And let's talk about range anxiety. I have that too before I went over to an electric vehicle. Why? I drove a diesel SUV and my diesel SUV had a 60 liter volume of fuel and with this I could do 900 up to 1100 kilometers with one charge or one tank. And yeah, that was quite comfortable, but also I used it. Meaning, when we go on vacation, I even was bothered by my wife, just stop by, I need to go to the toilet. And it annoyed me, because I just want to pull straight through. And yeah, then stress is programmed. So, what did we do? We need to stop 
and normally I was not that much much faster with my diesel than now with my EV. But then I bought an EV, I bought my Enyaq and everything changed. But what changed? It was not the car, it was my mindset. My mindset about travel. When I talk about travel, I mean in leisure time when you go on vacation, not if you have to do it in your job. That's a different story. And now I had to do stops because I get 350 kilometers when there's a lot of highway with one charge. So everything went slower. Everything was a bit more calm and I got calmer too. Traveling got lots, lots of easier for me, even if it took maybe a bit longer. But did it really? No, I don't think so. But it's a mind, it's your mind that changes, not the car. And now let's think about this example right here. When I talk about 60 liters of diesel, I talk about 588 kilowatt hours of energy because one liter of diesel is 9.8 kilowatt hours. And that's what I can do with my, back in the days, with my diesel SUV. Let's say it hits a thousand kilometers with that. Now my EV, my Enyaq. My Enyaq got about 77 kilowatt hours of net capacity. After my last state of health check, it has around uh, 73 kilowatt hours. So let's calculate with that. If you do the math, that is eight times the charge. So if you think about that, eight charges and a range of about 350 kilometers with a good mix of uh, highway, then I could go nearly three times as far as with my diesel because it's around about 2,900 kilometers with the same energy. And that again shows the, mm, the efficiency of an electric vehicle. Of course, I cannot do it in one drive, but who goes 2,900 kilometers in one drive? Um, so on a normal trip, I charge one or two times and that's perfectly fine for me. But of, but, but it is a change of mind. It's not the change of car and you need to adapt that. And you cannot do this by watching a video or hearing people talk about how fine and great and stuff like that, all that is. You need to experience it for yourself. And maybe if you do not do this shift in your mind, electric uh, e-mobility will be a tough thing for you. Even though it might be the future for all of us, it is a tough thing to do then. So I had to slightly adjust my position because the sun was shining so hard on my black iPhone, it overheated and stopped recording. So now I'm standing behind a rock, which provides a bit of shadow for the phone. Let's talk about the other great and big and important topic, charging stress. And I do not mean the stress you have when you go in main vacation time and try to get a free spot at an Ionity or uh, the trouble you might experience with a slow AC charger to get it started. I mean the stress people do to themselves when they go on vacation and they fear that at their destination are not enough possibilities to charge. This might apply for some regions in Europe, but there are only a few left. Most of the regions are well equipped with chargers if you know how to do it. So first thing is, don't stress yourself. Go into your vacation with ease, because stress is the last thing you want to have on vacation. Next up, get a bit of an overview. You do not need to plan every, every day and every route for your three weeks holiday. It's enough when you look up the regions you're going and what chargers are there. And that's what I tell people. And normally I get responses like, yeah, but that don't work. And even if you go to Engadin, where I'm right now, there are not enough chargers. A colleague at work said to me, I got many emails with the same, how do you prepare? How many charging apps do you have? How to be secure? What uh, to get charged? What do you take on adapters and stuff with? None. I only have my Type 2 cable, which Skoda provided with me. I only have two apps, that's PowerPass and the German EMBW. No advertising here, nobody sponsored me. I pay for these apps, I pay for my charging. And that's fine, I did everything with that and it works out. Why? Because, yeah, first of all, I take a big picture where I'm going and how many chargers are there. Second thing, I do not fear slow shot charging in, on vacation because I'm there to relax for sightseeing, for hiking, for doing something. And so the car is standing still for a couple of hours and I charge. The other thing is don't fear slow charges like a 50k 
kilowatt charger. Yes, they are old and we are experiencing much faster charging with the Enyaq, but that's enough to charge up on vacation. You're not in a hurry. You need to calm down. This is one part. The other part, you may charge a bit earlier. Don't go to the last uh, percent of state of charge, like we did here. I went to the charger quite above 60% and charged up to 90% plan this inside your route or do an unexpected stop if you need to charge somewhere because you fear on the next couple of hundred kilometers there won't be a charger. Get creative about it. See it as an experience like with the mindset about range anxiety. Take it as an electric experience. Yeah, I know. If you don't get used to it, it won't be for you. But if you get really used to it, it could be a lot of fun and you could see stuff and experience stuff you never believed you would experience before. So my recommendation is just try it out. Next departure at two o'clock 50. And why I'm showing you that it's because we are already waiting four minutes and the last departure of the train through the Verainer tunnel was at two o'clock 20. So did we miss it? No. There we, we, where we have to need to pay the fee for this train we were at 219 but hey we didn't make it on the train because Swiss trains are always on time and that's why the car in front of me and I didn't get on this train, even though it would be only 30 seconds more than 220. But why I'm telling you about this and why don't we drive over the Flüela Pass as we did when we drove to the Engadin? Well, that's because of our dog. Yeah, I have something better to do than standing here with road work just at my left side making noises you might hear as well. But Marley doesn't like passes or to be honest, he hates them. And on our way to Engadin, he puked because this is just too much for this dog, even though he is quite used to Alpine passes. So if you travel with your dog and you didn't drove such passes already, be careful because he might not like driving over passes and will puke. And that's where those trains come in handy, where we can drive through the mountain instead of over the mountain. And yes, we are even faster when we take the train, even if we are waiting 30 minutes right here. So yeah, uh, I really hope that we could catch the train at 2.20, but we missed it. So now my wife and I will chill a bit, wait for the train, and then we are on our way back home. And there we are back from our short vacation and we are at home again. After the Autofallat or car train, there was nothing special. It was a flawless drive back home. Regarding car train, for our dog, it's the best way to drive instead of going over the pass with all its bends. But what's for your dog the best, you should know. And so, yeah, do whatever you like or what you're dog likes. But now let's look at the data. First of all, I show you my current state of charge. And as you can see, this is 56%. So if we do a little math, I went to the slow charger once in vacation from a bit about 60% up to 88%. It was not needed. I would have way more than 20% SOC when I'm back home, even if I took the pass instead of the car train. Yes, it would be lower then, but still it would be a sufficient SOC to come back home. So the charge was not needed. Let's talk about driving data. On our way to the Engadin, I will show you right here, it was about 23 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. And now we look at the stats for driving home and please be assured this is real data. And you see it right here. Yes, you see that right. It's 5.9 kilowatt hours, 100 kilometers. Yes, it was 40 kilometers less due to the car train. And we were really slow because <clears throat> of the road we had. This data is real because you need to think about 
Pontresina, where our hotel was, is at around 200 meters. And where we live here, it's about 450, 500 meters above sea level. And all that energy converts back. And since we did not take the pass, but the way through the mountain, this stat is real. So you need, for a real calculation, you need to look at this data and the drive there and put it together. So now I show you another value. It's since I've charged. So here are also the kilometers we drive at our destination to get our hikes and stuff like that. It's 12.7 kilowatt hours. And if you now do some math, I didn't because I just reached home. I think uh, it will be the average consumption will be 16 kilowatt hours, 100 kilometers. I will put it down here uh, when I edit the video. And so I have the right value, but now I don't have the mind to calculate. So yeah, you find it here in the video. And by the way, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you did not subscribe already, consider to subscribe and help this channel to grow, especially if you find my videos helpful and useful. Also consider to give me a small donation via PayPal or YouTube Thanks, because that really helps me out. It's of course completely optional. It's also great if you just watch the video. And so I hope you will also watch the next video. And until then, stay full of energy.